oversight and the, the government doesn't have like uh, uh, or whatever government is it, really limited and doesn't have like um, its own initiatives and stuff the market controls like all the facets and stuff and accomplishments of a given society mm-hmm. uh, so uh, you know what uh, when we use free market in this discussion, let's uh, unless we give some sort of context, I guess we can assume that's that's what we're talking about, some sort of like a pure free market system. My concern with that idea is uh, that there are there exist spaces of mm-hmm. achievement that such a system cannot adequately answer without uh, either uh, without either one not achieving those things or two not causing extreme harm to uh, hmm. uh, people or the ideas themselves. Interesting. So what what is it about the free market, about people voluntarily uh, cooperating with each other that makes it, for you, makes you think that somehow these certain things won't get accomplished? And I, I think you're right that certain things won't get accomplished. Um, however, the second part of that is why those things that don't get accomplished due to voluntary cooperation, why are those things so important? I mean, if they're so important that they needed to get done, how come is it no one's voluntarily willing to accomplish them? Because people don't have, uh, people don't have the, uh, 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 in terms of like societies in general, don't have the capacity to always pursue the, the best choice. They pursue what they want. Um, not necessarily what a philosophically or rational uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, or rational good thing is, whether you define that philosophically, rational, mm-hmm. or morally, society as a whole don't always pursue the best option. Who decides what is best? Who makes that definitional decision? Right. Uh, that's the issue. Like with the, with the free market, uh, what's best is determined by uh, what what uh, most people want or what can what entrepreneurs can find a a, a, a a market for what can be what can turn a profit. That's what's defined okay. as uh, as best in terms of large accomplishments. So you said the majority and entrepreneurs, and I think for me, in my understanding of the market system, it wouldn't have to do with majority. Like for instance. Um, music. There are you know thousands of different tastes in music, and uh, that through a process by which people voluntarily create and try to sell their particular uh, skills and you know and 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 uh, re- you know recordings and this kind of thing. They so it's not about a majority. What I'm trying to get to is that the market can cater to the smallest niche that you can possibly imagine in terms of pretty much any, you know, product or resource or, you know, tradable commodity. Um, and then entrepreneurs, I don't think entrepreneurs is what the marketplace is about. Entrepreneurs are the tools the marketplace uses to, uh, achieve the, the, it's to get its wants and needs met that certain, that simply entrepreneurs are responding to what they perceive as now they're not always successful, and you know sometimes in different businesses they're, they often fail. But at least the entrepreneur takes his own property and invests it in a risky venture, in which that they perceive that some profit could be made because there is a marketplace need or demand for this thing, and that they fulfill that marketplace need or demand. Um, right. Uh, uh, I, I understand that uh, those are parts of how the market works and uh, that's like the re- music can be produced by individuals or mm-hmm. like a group of like a hundred individuals to a nice symphony or a concert mm-hmm. or whatever sure. uh, and those are uh, and they can even create niche music mm-hmm. and that only serves a few thousand people and those things do work uh, obviously if you can see them functioning just just yeah. fine and and you mentioned like businesses and risk uh, you know like some 50 percent of startups or more fail but I understand those aspects of the market I have no problem with the fact, it's obvious that the market does work to solve a great many problems, but mm-hmm. uh, my concern is that there exist uh, uh, problem spaces that cannot be uh, solved with that attitude, with that approach. For okay. like, uh, uh, you might say that uh, uh, parasites and a certain species of uh, fish, and how that certain species of parasite affect fish, be- that certain species of fish behavior is a, um, a niche market, but the resources that go into it um, uh, to say researching that and funding funding understanding that or whatever would uh are not um in, in proportion with the uh, how niche that market is i mean okay. the cost of understanding that answer mm-hmm. is not um uh is not is not it, it requires it you lose out in terms of monetary gain when you 
you can try to invest resources better. Whereas like with music, you just need someone who's, you know, spent, you know, the 20, 25 years of their life into music through their either childhood, their school, whatever. Yeah. And then they go and they write music uh, and they can get with other people who understand music, that, that problem space, they're just exploring new sound space or whatever. But with uh, uh, with uh, certain neuroscientific research problems, the, the, the answers aren't, aren't known and there, there can, there's there, there very well maybe no return on mm-hmm. the sort of investment thousands of hours maybe even hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars mm-hmm. my question and, i guess yeah. is if there is no return on the investment of resources then why should resources be applied right so if i spend a billion dollars on trying to research how to turn lead into gold and it's just not possible why i mean like why should i spend other people's money to do that research if it's not useful, uh, well, uh, the, right. That that is the uh, part of the question. Thing for me, um, uh, I uh, I think that knowledge is just inherently valuable, and I don't mm-hmm. have a whole lot yeah. to back that up. Now, no, no, um, you, I I would agree uh, with you at least in and, uh, in, in my uh, own. I'm sorry. Um, although I don't, uh, I, this is, I have a I'm getting caught up on it minor point but sure. you can't turn lead into gold except the process to do so uh does it cost uh cost more than the end product gives you back out sure. it is like physically possible to change lead molecules you got to do is add a proton right uh the uh, some physicists were talking about you can do that yeah. but uh, you know there, the process would be so expensive it would be worth it mm-hmm. but um uh i just so uh, so why would I, we... know, I think that mm-hmm. knowledge is um Worth, worth, it's worth, worth whatever it costs. Period. Okay. Well, um, now, t- t- realize that realize and... realize that if you take that stand, that it creates a lot of distortions. So, for instance, if you're right, and let's assume that knowledge is worth whatever it costs, then we wouldn't devote any resources towards anything else, right? Because techn well, because uh, because knowledge is good for its own sake. To, you should devote resources to uh, the, 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 a, the minimum amount of resources necessary to optimizing knowledge acquisition. Well, you know, now optimizing is a little bit different, right? So, again, who makes the decision and how much knowledge? Because now we're not talking about knowledge is absolute. Now it, we're talking about, well, knowledge optimization, not maximization. So now we're, now we're talking about, like, discrete intervals in which we could produce resources. Who decides how much resources should go to knowledge and what that optimization would be? Right. Uh, I mean, uh, in a free market system, you have just a lot of individuals who have their own uh, interests and stuff, competing interests and desires and uh, exchange of culture and stuff. And the market with, you know, just varies uh, back and forth in whatever states it is to satisfy what is happening at the, at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it, it, it's just a, it, it's a very, very human um, experience in one way. But uh, uh, I don't think that the that that has the capacity to individual uh, a coagulant of individual interests like that has the capacity to um, further long term interests of humanity. But do does a central authority have the legitimate right to make decisions on what the long term's interests for humanity is? What if they they get it wrong? Uh, sure. I mean, that is, those are the kinds of, uh, concerns, uh, but, uh, I don't, uh, uh, my concern is that it's easier for a government to get long-term, uh, interest right mm-hmm. if it's set up properly right. than it is it's for the market to get long-term interest correct. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it's easier to extort resources from people than it is to produce them, Right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, which is like I'm saying, like if you were to do this, do get like say, ignoring the knowledge is an absolute thing, but like say you wanted to uh, establish uh, a lot of scientific research and, uh, with the goal of uh, uh, a goal of say producing friendly AI and getting humanity off of Earth and distributing mm-hmm. our species to other uh, systems. Sure, uh, if that was your goal, mm-hmm. uh, then. I think there exists the only way a free market would be able to accomplish those goals is if the people's culture uh, created an ad hoc uh, commitment of resources to that goal. 
uh, you would have to have enough people with enough of the same cultural value supporting that goal, uh, creating, creating basically market resources committing to accomplishing that goal. And uh, the question is whether or not that is, uh, that is actually feasible and possible before uh, we either kill ourselves as a species or we are destroyed by uh, an asteroid or uh, cosmic radiation. Well, I mean, so you're saying that we need a involuntary um, extortion of resources to fund projects for possible calamitous stuff that may or may not ever happen. Oh, it will happen. We will be struck by an asteroid, and we will hit it. We've seen terminal uh, uh, solar radiation. Those are right. inevitable. Those are a physical possibility that cannot be avoided. Okay, in terms of probabilities over an infinite timeline, right? Uh, no, no, over the time of the existing timeline, known timeline of the uh, of the universe within, you know, um, the next hundred thousand, within the next uh, within the next million years, re uh, realistic timelines, those things will absolutely happen. Uh, yeah. But we can't get around them. The probability goes up too high, and then we're going to be hit by an asteroid that will wipe out uh, either most of or all of humanity or. You know, I'm not denying that it could happen. I'm just denying that we have the ability to predict that it will, no matter how high the probabilities go up. So, like, for instance, if I say there's a 99.99999% chance of rain tomorrow, is it going to rain tomorrow? Yes. Really? Yes, it is a rational thing to commit resources uh, uh, to... Absolutely. Uh, ...and acting as if it will rain. Oh, sure, um, sure, like sure. Tonight is, like, in terms of, like, a positive truth value, no, you haven't, like, proven in terms right. of like, a philosophical truth that it will rain. Right. But in terms of what's rational to act on, right. absolutely. Sure, it will, it will, it sure. And that if, if that information is out there, then why wouldn't people work on it cooperatively and voluntarily? If it's so because obvious... Uh, because sometimes information is not always out there because of resources to gather in that information uh, don't turn a profit, and two, people aren't rational. Maybe. I mean, here's the thing. I, I just don't I, – I personally can't condone unethical actions. You know what I mean? So for me, it, primarily the issue becomes an ethical one. It's simply unethical to extort involuntarily resources to do something that somebody else wants. It just doesn't ethically it's ever make sense for me. It's short term, yeah, but it's ethical for the uh, long-term viability yeah. of one's descendants. <sighs> Again, like – like if, if there is a if there's a if, if it's it, it's unethical to kill someone, but mm -hmm. if there is a plane full of suicide bombers coming toward your uh, tower or toward a population center, mm -hmm. is it ethical to shoot that down? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the answer is is to me yes. It's ethical to murder those people in order to save more. Mm -hmm. And the same thing comes in with uh, uh, committing to long term uh, projects like asteroid deflection. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it's I mean, unethical for people to not commit to those projects, in my opinion. All right, all right. You know, actually, it's interesting. Like, I th just from that little uh, bit that you gave me, um, I'm getting the idea, the sense that you commit to uh, an ethical, you have an ethical commitment to what's called utilitarianism, which is the greatest good for the greatest number. Um, it makes sense in some cases, I think. Okay. Is there any cases that you see that doesn't make sense? Uh, you'd have to be careful how you define what the greatest good is. Yeah. That's that's where the uh, the issue comes mm -hmm. in. Like, um, if you say, I believe in the greatest good for the greatest number, someone will say then, all right, well, the greatest good is that everyone um, everyone has a red sweater, mm -hmm. and I'm going to extort, use uh, the power of extortion mm -hmm. to make sure everyone gets a red sweater. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where, like, say, problems uh, come in. It's what is the great, what defines as the, the legitimate greatest mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. um, like, uh, a, a, uh, I mean that, that's basically where the, you know some of the things and discussions come in. And, sure. um, I don't have like uh, well-defined answers in that mm -hmm. area, but I think the fact is that there are some undeniable uh, greatest goods that uh, you that you can't avoid, uh, and others would require more discussion, I suppose. Mm -hmm. um, well, like I like for example, Obama thinks that uh, uh, he stated the. One of the a, a greatest good is providing health care to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, he, you know, it's a human right. I've heard him and many other people say on, on video, it is a human right that people have uh, access to uh, affordable uh, medical health care or whatever. Um, 
that is an example of a modern greater good in the United States and other countries that mm-hmm. that is there's controversy over. Um, sure. Uh, you know, is that a greatest good with community resources too? That you know, those those sorts of things. And where do you, uh, how do you, how do you draw the line? How do you know when when it's right. appropriate? It, it, but then again, when is it appropriate to extort someone? That's that's you know, the thing. Mm-hmm. When is it okay to extort someone? At, at what cost? But, so yeah. I, th- I think we get, there is a there gets to be a problem with certain kinds of things when we say you know we should provide th- that that certain goods should be re- should be extorted from people because it's in the greatest interest of all. So for instance, it's in it's in everyone's interest to be secure in their person, right? Yes. To not to not to not be attacked. Yeah. Yeah. So right. so what would be a really really nice amount of security for each person? Like to make it so that they would never be attacked or victim of crime. Uh, each person should have the capacity to defend themselves okay. in any situation. That way, there you go. You're you're, you're not right. secure in your person. What if someone said a central planner said, "Well, that's not enough security. People need more security than even that. I am going right. to extort enough resources so that everyone gets their own bodyguard with an armed bodyguard with a bulletproof vest, twenty four seven watch. What about that?" Uh, right, that that's the type of uh, uh, issue or mm-hmm. arguments that come up in a system where extorting people for the greatest good come up because uh, that those are the types of arguments that come up and mm-hmm. they are a, a huge concern. Like there are some things I would you know, like you said, find accept, uh, find um, crazy run, or on a, a waste of resources. Um, mm-hmm. Ostensibly speaking, there's nothing wrong with every person having a bodyguard. No. But given a current, um, I think the current, say, budget uh, of a, of, a, of existing governments, um, it wouldn't make sense to commit resources to that objective at, at this time. For, for right? everyone to have their own bodyguard, there would need to be enough GDP to basically the people who aren't guardy bodyguards to be able to afford the living and expenses and of the bodyguard. So essentially everyone had to make double the amount of, uh, of productivity in order to afford the bodyguard. Now it doesn't have to stop there. Of course it, you could say, no, a bodyguard isn't quite enough security. Everyone needs a bodyguard and a tank, right? And so, a personal army. and a personal army, why not? You know what I mean? So like healthcare is the same thing. I mean, everyone deserves healthcare. Well, how much healthcare should they deserve? $1 million of healthcare, $1 billion. Why not 1 trillion? If they have a right to it, 1 trillion is not enough. Right? There is no, you know, dis- uh, discrete point at which you can say, well, that's too much healthcare, if it's a right. Right. Um, which is like through, uh, would it, uh, I would suppose a utilitarian would respond, you'd have to wait. Uh, the, 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 your discrete points would be arbitrary, and you would mm-hmm. have to weight your points based on your uh, uh, current goals and uh, current objectives. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, um, and you'd have to allocate your budget mm-hmm. properly. Which means that your rights would be uh, uh, would be uh, fluid and variable based on um, context. And my laptop's battery power is dying. Oh, okay. So I need to plug my computer. In. All right. Well, Mr. Johnson has uh, walked away for a moment as he plugs in his laptop. Um, Let's see. I don't. See, we have invited Paul to this conversation, but I don't see him um, anywhere. There we go. All right. Very good. So we're back. Um, I guess I don't. I might. I'm not advocating. I, I can't strongly advocate any a particular viewpoint. The issue is because I can see potential problems with uh, any particular viewpoint, and mm-hmm. uh, I, so I can't strongly advocate one. All I can do is change, rapidly change position, arguing for each one until I can find <laughs> one with the least holes or something. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. So I, I would at least I would say I have two problems with utilitarianism, um, and I I don't know if it's possible for a utilitarian to come up with. A rebuttal to this, which is satisfactory at least to me. First uh, problem I have with utilitarianism is I'm not sure if it is even possible for a utilitarian to do what they say they, that people should do. I'm not sure if it is possible for human beings to predict the future. 
You know, they can predict it with a reasonable degree of accuracy if the future is very close, but that doesn't mean they're actually predicting. I mean, in other words, if you're wrong on your prediction, then that means you did the opposite of what your utilitarian theory told you to do. You tried to obey your utilita utilitarian theory, but you ended up doing the thing that created less optimization of human good, right? So if you can't predict the future, I don't see how you can do a utilitarian ethical analysis because that, that requires you to know what's going to happen. You have to have omniscience to have utilitarian theory. Uh, I suppose the utilitarian would then say, well, then it would be in the best interest of the, a group of deciders to uh, create a baseline for uh, uh, what's acceptable to take action on in terms of probability. Yeah. Uh, like you shouldn't have, take anything below a certain level uh, of, of probability or something. I don't know. And when, there are, when, they, get, when they predict cor incorrectly, are they going to resign from being the deciders? Uh, I would. I have no. I would be support such uh, <laughs> attitude. But, uh, you know, if you if your decision making, yeah. your decisions tend to not pan out. You should be swapped for a different decision. -making. Right, right. In other words, you know, you're probably not a good predictor of uh, the future. Okay. And so the second thing, um, not only can they not predict the future, but they can't know what the good is, because the good has to be decided. In other words. What is the good if it, other than the individual meeting of needs by each person? In other words, I want to get my needs met. And how would that central planner person know what my preferences are better than I do? And so how is utilitarianism ever going to be an efficient in meeting the good? Even if they could predict it, they don't know what it is. I don't know uh, what well, the good is for you. The good of, well, it, uh, you. I don't see that uh, societal utilitarianism isn't good at meeting, uh, isn't isn't adapt at meeting mm -hmm. the good of the individual. Mm -hmm. It's only adapt at meeting the good of a large set of things. I mean, like mm -hmm. if you had a utilitarianism for the individual, it'd be good at meeting the good the what is good for that individual. But mm -hmm. or adapt at meeting the good for that individual. But if mm -hmm. you have utilitarianism applied to society, then it wouldn't be adept at individualized good. Well, I mean, you'd have to. You'd have to. That's a that's a that's a scale you'd have to choose. If you don't know what your discrete individual goods are, how would you ever aggregate them? Right. Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. Um, if you don't have individual values, how could you ever average them? Well, uh, right. If you don't have, if you generally don't have individual values, and you couldn't average them, right. sure. So I, obviously the utilitarian would just disagree with you there at that point. Saying well, yeah, they, 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 the, the utilitarian people. says, well, we can do it. We can predict the future well enough, and we can know what people's goods are well enough. Right. And, yeah, and so, so really what my response would be, well, then what you're telling me is you really don't know what the hell you're doing. <laughs> There's no guarantee you ever get it right. You just tell me you do. And to me that sounds like an awful lot like dictatorship, tyranny. I mean, hot, you know what I mean? If I disagree with you, you just say, well, no, that wasn't the greatest good. Or, no, that really wasn't the right prediction. Or, you just, your opinions don't matter because it's the greatest. So, in other words, utilitarianism is, I think, some kind of, uh, you know, I mean, I think pe most of the utilitarians are well-intentioned. Don't get me wrong. But I think the results, the in, in the real world, the, the implications or result of utilitarianism ends up being one person controls another person. Yes, I can. I can see your concerns in that area. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, uh, 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 yeah, I, I can see how that uh, could be a concern for people who are not in favor of uh, util strong utilitarianism. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying I am again, which sure. like I mentioned. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, you'd have to. Yep, I can see how you can how you would have concerns in regards to that. Uh, how would but how do you not prevent the same sort of problems occurring in a free market in terms of uh, lots of people being extorted by um, uh, a, uh, uh, a one individual or small group of individuals? Because then you, at some point you've got to stop people from have a way to prevent people from harming you. Mm -hmm. uh, as an individual, even, Absolutely. even if you're like a utilitarian, utilitarian says, well, my group of utilitarians would do that because we'd have checks and balances. Well, a utilitarian could only defend himself if that wasn't the greatest good, right? So a utilitarian well, could... Well, you would only be able to use the greatest goods resources to, to defend, the greatest, uh, defend the greatest good 
So, for instance, if I was attacked by a, I don't know, an oncologist who could save people's lives, then I think a utilitarian who has, you know, does some kind of menial labor job would have a difficult time trying to justify his defense of himself um, other than the fact that, well, if this oncologist is attacking me, then somehow... I mean, you see how you see maybe how the, maybe the final, the, the last remaining oncologist would be a better analogy. <laughs> okay, well, well, it doesn't see the thing is is that this utilitarianism, this utilitarian, he can't know what the greatest good is in any given situation. So I'm attacked by an oncologist and I'm a menial labor laborer. Let's say, like I can't know whether a t a defending myself and killing the oncologist to defend myself is going to be in the greatest good, or if it's going to be in the greatest good to let him kill me and then he gets to save lots of lives. How would I know? Um, yeah, uh, what about, uh, that is, that would be a problem, I suppose. Uh, of course, I'm not adept at utilitarianism to be able to know whether mm -hmm. or not that is a good or bad objection. But, mm -hmm. um, if it is a good objection, then why not some sort of uh, blend of balance? Yeah, but then again, <laughs> that was what the, you know, like the federal, the, uh, the, uh, Articles of Confederation, so it's where it's trying sure. to create a balance sure. between individual right. needs and uh, group needs. The question is, can you philosophically blend these things without contradiction? I don't think that's necessary. It's not necessary to not be contradictory? Um, for certain cases, uh, I, I don't see uh, that there would be an issue. In, I mean, I don't... I don't uh, Valuing, no, I mean, I don't. If 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 you could, uh, again, that's just a utilitarian attitude. If if there was more good to be derived from an, an instance of contradiction, I'm not sure what the issue would be. Um, so if we are, so, why, so there really are no contradictions. Why is it? A, what is it? Why is it a contradiction, and not just a trade-off? I mean, it, I guess it, 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 it can be a philosophical contradiction, mm -hmm. but um, so. I think, philosophy doesn't necessarily map to reality. Well, if it doesn't, then it's probably a bad philosophy. Um, how about this? So if we say we take a blend, say we say, well, when the government does things, it will be utilitarian in nature, that the government will only be able to act, or the state will only be able to act when the greatest good is at stake. And then, but on a personal level, we will uh, subscribe to a theory of natural rights, for instance, that people have these indisputable, in, in, inalienable um, uh, natural rights by nature of their rationality to not be attacked um, by violence, to not be coerced or threatened by violence, and not to be uh, have their goods and property stolen or extorted or yada yada. So what you end up having there is is kind of a contradiction. On, but you've you've kind of separate mentally compartmentalized it, right? So I see what you're saying. I understand that. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, you mean like for a, a, a very strict instance, let's say that uh, um, uh, it is in the uh, greatest uh, good of the. It's in the interest of the greatest good uh, to hypothetically here. I don't mm -hmm. necessarily agree with this, but hypothetically, it's in the interest of the greatest good to apprehend some class of terrorists. But uh, the way the ter these particular terrorists operate requires the suspension of habeas corpus, uh, uh, and say assuming that is a assuming that is a right or something, uh, or uh, the suspension of some section. Uh, some minority or even a majority mm -hmm. of people's free right. speech is that acceptable? Right. Uh, even if it's in the interest of the greatest good. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, right. I mean, that so, is part so, of the issue. So, for instance, recently um, a CIA drone killed an American citizen who was, you know, um, accused of being a terrorist. Um, he didn't get right. due process of law, and you know, there, so there there are contradictions within the law that allow the government to say, well, we're going to obey these laws which contradict with those laws because we like those laws better. And so, what do you have? You don't have rule of law. You just have law rule of interpretation, and who gets to be the interpreter? Right, and you have rule of uh, circumstance, mm -hmm. uh, political circumstance, yeah. and cultural circumstance. It's tyrannical whim. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and that is uh, one of the problems that I think needs to be addressed by um, any particular system. Sure. Is how you, uh, is, um, tyrannical whim whether accidental or intentional is something that should be avoided uh, or needs, I would think would be a good thing to avoid. Sure. Most people 
would ostensibly not desire. Right, right. Um, but I think there, you have to be careful. You have to figure out you know, ways to solve that problem. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, as long uh, as there are human beings, right, That and human beings are fallible, how can any one human being control legitimately a control another, right? Because, I mean, right. we could take the most perfect human being and say, we'll put you in charge, yet how is he going to get it right? He's just as fallible as the rest of us. Well, right. That's why. Uh, or she. To, that's why you know systems of distributed government were invented. Um, well, <laughs> why were they invented? I, I I don't know. I mean, well, they're invented to reduce to reduce the probability of uh, a single point of failure. I mean, because if you have a system that relies on one person, um, then he's your single point of failure. But if you have a more distributed form of government. Yeah, yeah. If one point does failure, uh, it, uh, fail, it's uh, it should work out because the other systems will be able to uh, compensate in an appropriate manner. Oh, I see what you mean. Like, like the different, like the idea of the states will have a certain amount of independence to try certain uh, things, and if they fail, then it won't uh, hurt the larger whole too much. Right. Or if uh, if the uh, president decides, mm-hmm. or what, if you have a president who wants to commit to some terrible action, whatever it may be, mm-hmm. he can't simply because the systems that, that would mean that, that would, uh, like the military, the police or whatever, or the, or the judiciary system just would be like, look at him like, we're not going to do that because, you know, we have other uh, rules that we, we can't do that. Sorry. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what you, you mm-hmm. what you want us to do. We can't do that because you know, you're not the uh, ultimate. And, not the ultimate head, so. and understand that the free market would be like the ultimate distributive justice, distributive resource system. Um, I think that a, it could be, mm-hmm. but the uh, free market, the problem I have with the free market is it allows for the creation of monopolies, which creates points of failure. Do you think that monopolies are part of the free market system? Um, I don't see how they're not. Okay. Can you think of a monopoly out there that didn't become a monopoly through government intervention and political uh, resources? Um, I'm not well versed uh, in such things, so I don't, I, sure. I don't know either way. So I'm thinking of like, you know, Standard Oil, J.P. Morgan, you know, the, the money trusts, the all these different things are, you know, industries, you know, the, uh, the railroad tycoons are all industries which... You know, used. Uh, yes, I can think of a monopoly that became a monopoly without government intervention. Okay. Microsoft. Microsoft. All right. Well, you know, is Microsoft a monopoly without government intervention? I believe it is. I'm not aware of. That. What? I, I'm, I'm aware of where government has curbed aspects of Microsoft, but I'm not. Okay. Well, what about this? If you are, go ahead and re-educate me. I have no sure, sure. With that. Well, I would, I would t- point to the government's protection of Microsoft's intellectual property as the reason why that, you know, the reason why they have the resources and success that they have, that this uh, uh, illegitimate protection of intellectual property is probably Microsoft's key to success, that they don't actually produce better products. They're just better at patent law. Right. And that's, that's uh, what enables, they have a a monopoly um, on the, uh, on the force necessary to maintain uh, the uh, the access or control of their mm-hmm. own monopoly and right. to increase that uh, increase that power. Mm-hmm. But uh, I mean, if you're st- okay, if we're talking about like uh, okay, not even to just my mind for a pure market system where you think of like um, where you can, I guess, if you're thinking where it's okay to uh, s- uh, steal or not steal, well, it's still be common nomenclature, but to use uh, someone else's uh, uh, blueprints and ideas and ideas have no ownership and property. And you the only property you own is the property you can defend. If uh, you mean uh, free market by that, um, then if, uh, you're going to see people organizing groups uh, with a centralized leader form ad hoc governments, uh, even, if it's their, even if they're just corporations, they'll act the same. Purchase land from people, use uh, uh, slow sell out tactics like Microsoft to acquire, I mean, not Microsoft, but, uh, yeah, like Microsoft and like Walmart to acquire new market niches mm-hmm. and um, uh, prevent um, either by, by even just by raw force uh, uh, other, other entities from moving, moving in 
uh, and establishing a more distributed system. I mean, I, I like distributed systems, but mm -hmm. how would a free market prevent the rise of, uh, I don't know, of mm -hmm. a, a large system, I suppose? So you're saying that if we had a truly pure, pure free market system uh, and then someone creates something like Microsoft and starts marketing their operating system and then someone uh, writes their own copy of it, uh, mm -hmm. uh, either through hard work or through uh, actual theft or whatever, um, that that competition would prevent the construction of, monop of a monopoly? So, there, you know... Is, is that what you're saying? I'm saying that in a free market system, what's called a natural monopoly, in other words, a monopoly that comes about through its, its very nature, is not... Um, it, it's economically possible. It's just not very economically likely. There are so many factors working against a monopolist that actually exploits the consumer. All right. So there, it is possible to have a monopoly that doesn't exploit the consumer, but it's probably not likely to have a mono. There's probably not. It's, it's not very likely to have a or probable to have a monopolist that actually can exploit the consumer. As soon as well, someone tries. To, to gain a monopoly on whatever this thing, you know, whatever the, whatever kind of industry you try to select, um, the only reason they get to be as big as they are is that either government is helping them or because they are somehow serving consumers better than everyone else. So either they serve consumers so well that everyone else can't compete, um, and in that case, then really what's the problem with having a, a, a monopoly of, of a business? If, if they're serving you better than anyone else can possibly do it, I don't have a problem with them. The only problem with Monopoly gets kind of eth ethically uh, questionable is when they uh, smash their competition through various losses and then they try to then exploit the, co the consumer um, afterwards. But as soon as they begin to exploit the consumer, suddenly they've lost their competitive uh, edge, right? So now all, you know, they can try to... Cons yes, but they don't have any competitors because well, they have reached a point where they can exploit people. So, okay, let's say there's uh, three guys, and they're all there's me, you, and Paul. Paul isn't in the conversation yet, but um, I'm going to be the evil monopolist in this case. So I, you know, I'm going to try to outcompete the, the two of you, and eventually, um, you know, you uh, have to reduce your uh, output to just do some kind of really, really high quality product. Uh, we make widgets. You make a really, really high quality uh, widget to kind of compete with my high end, but not quite as high end as yours widget. And then Paul goes out of business completely, since he's not here. <laughs> um, okay. So now when I, as long as I'm being really competitive and you're really struggling to try to find your market niche in this industry, then, you know, you really struggle and I'm somehow, for whatever reason, I'm more competitive. Um, then say, let's say, for instance, now I want to start, try to, try to start, uh, I want to start exploiting the consumers and I'm going to raise my prices up. Well, what will you do? Uh, well, if you, in, if I'm, if I'm having, if I'm still turning a minor profit at that yeah. point, um, a minor profit by I reducing would, your, I'm sorry, you're, you're achieving a minor profit by reducing your productivity to a small workforce that turns out a very high quality product at a, at a slightly more expensive price than mine, but some consumers want that extra quality, so they pay for that. Right. Um, now I'm increasing my price. Before you couldn't compete, but now I'm increasing my. Say I'm increasing my price of my product to slight, just you know, the same as what your slightly higher quality product is. Well, some uh, some people might uh, try to uh, purchase uh, from me, but that's assuming sure. so you're you're assuming that the larger corporation with more free funds mm -hmm. um, isn't going to take. Uh, I mean, in a fair system where that exists, um, uh, uh, people, uh, I might start achieving more, cons uh, more um, mon uh, budget-minded consumers as uh, mm -hmm. I, yeah. I not only is my product, product higher quality, yeah. they, they're receiving a better uh, value per dollar they right. spend. You would the problem is if that company has more disposable income, they can hire someone to destroy my business. Mm -hmm. Uh, at, with a physical force level, uh, at a force level I can't uh, protect myself from. Okay, okay. Um, well, they that, can well, force that's... their consumers, like they could put a drug in their product that uh -huh. forces their consumers to buy their pro to <laughs> continually buy their product. Okay. Uh, or their widget. <laughs> I'm just saying, there, there are things yeah. that monopoly can do that, that you cannot compete against. 
Um, okay, well, that, that you've thrown in a, a lot of different uh, things in there. Okay, so <laughs> my, 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 what I expected you to say is, well, you would just increase production, right? Because if you can produce this slightly higher quality product for the same price that I am at, then guess who's more competitive? You are, right? And, and now that Paul is out of business, you can probably buy his factory that he made his widgets with, and you can probably buy that at a steal. It means that is a way to compete with a yeah. monopoly in a system where the monopoly doesn't have some sort of um, okay. um, unethical edge. Right. That's okay. The if you well, go into an unethical edge, uh, that's what people are concerned about. Unethical. Like, okay. Drugs in the system, or something that you cannot compete against without yes. breaking your own world. So unethical edge. So. Let's say I send my security forces against your factory to attack your factory. Okay. What what is going to happen? I'm going to try to defend myself. Sure, sure. Now, how expensive is it going to be for me to hire people who are security people who are probably going to get killed in your defense of your factory? I'd say again. Uh, how expensive is it going to be for me to hire people who are potentially going to get killed to attack your factory? In, from your security people defending it. Why do you have to hire them? If they don't do it, they're going to lose their jobs. And they need their jobs to feed their family. Well, then they'll just hire on with you or somebody else. Uh, 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 if I'm a... Can, they can, yeah. but, that, uh, but people in, in, that, in those situations are afraid to do that because they're sure. afraid that if they act as an individual, the, the, their friends uh, won't act with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, and then there will still be a monopoly that will come after them and they will be victimized. Um, uh, imagine and this. That fear keeps them in place mm -hmm. and obeying that authority. Imagine this. Imagine that, you know, it's a free market and I've done something, I've put on a really nasty blog on Walmart's website or not website, but on my blog, I put out a really nasty review of Walmart. Walmart sends security guards to my house to kill me. Um, I fight back. I kill one of them. They kill me. Okay. How much, how willing are you to then shop at Walmart? What does that do to Walmart's profit, mo uh, profit uh, line? Um, that would depend on whether or not uh, Walmart has uh, inserted cocaine into the products I purchased from them. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna do is force and cocaine. All right. So I mean, it, I mean, uh, I would I would act against them in uh, if uh, as possible. Yeah. But the, uh, that's the the issue. I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, I would act where possible. If Walmart, and, uh, if Walmart was, where possible. Yeah, if Walmart was to attack you, and I heard about that on the free market news. I'd be like, well, those bastards, I'm not going to buy anything from them. You know what I mean? Like, I already don't like corporations as it is. You know what I mean? Like, why would I? I'm not going to. If he's going to. You're killing people? Are you, what, what are you kidding? What grocery store are you going to go to in your town if Walmart's the only grocery store in your town? You'd have to grow your food yourself at that point and start from the ground up. But if the Walmart, <laughs> but if, uh, the Walmart patrol comes by your house and sees you growing your own food, yeah. they'll destroy your garden and maybe threaten you. So, right. So what you're talking about, it seems to be like that in, in this scenario, Walmart has quickly already become the government, right? Yes. They're the ones with this overwhelming force and that just do whatever the hell they want. Uh, that's the, that is basically what the government can do. I right. Mean, uh, so you're saying that the free market would be bad because potentially we might have a government. Could form. Yes. Well, basically. so I see what I'm seeing here is that. Because the government exists. The government yeah. rose out of a fundamental existing free market. No. Oh, yes, it did. It has to. No, absolutely uh, not. Human beings started from a tribal free market uh, existence. Okay. We, we, we rose into civilization. Uh -huh. Anything that exists today is fundamentally the result of an individualistic free market. It I would disagree. To. I would disagree. No. How, not, how is it not? Because free market means that. Everything is voluntary. That 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 interactions between people are consensual. You're gonna to have to enforce voluntary, though. You, you can't. Just, voluntary doesn't exist without enforcement. Voluntary doesn't exist without involuntary enforcement. Yeah, because people, if, if you have a, an entity that is large enough to violate someone's voluntary action, mm -hmm. you have to find some way to stop them. Okay. Um, and uh, sometimes, uh, 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 if if all you have is a bunch of individuals and then suddenly a large collective shows up, that large collective has power over all those individuals until those individuals create another collective stronger than the enemy collective. I, 
I really, I'm finding it really hard to figure out where we go from tribal free market. And I'm, I'm okay with you there. Like, yeah, a de in most cases, tribal societies, you're going to have a, a pretty voluntary society. There's not going to be a, a whole lot of coercion going on in, in those right. societies. And, and you can see in South America, and, and, and so, until a large uh, European collective showed up, they, they were very distributed tribal societies. Individuals are free mm -hmm. to do whatever they wanted. Like, uh, the I mean, the Peter Hodge tribe is very, they're very individualistic. Yeah. Uh, uh, they, but uh, uh, you would you'd probably have to say that the Aztecs were not voluntary society, right? Oh no, I was, yeah, the, yeah. The, you have the rise of large uh, yes. cultures and pockets in there. But I was, sure. I was talking about the tribes. That oh, were absolutely, part of absolutely. And I and I'm just beginning to delve into some of the research on some of this stuff. I was reading some articles about tribes in Papua New Guinea and um, in New Zealand, and it's freaking amazing and just amazing uh, the treatment that they when they have a problem. Um, for instance, I was reading this one. I think this was. New Zealand, um, or maybe it was Papua New Guinea, one or the other, uh, the tribe, if they, if someone stole something from someone else, they would actually surround that person um, in a circle with their hands, and they would say something that they really liked about that person. Right, and um, in another tribe, for example, uh, they believe that... Uh, 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 um because they don't have a concept of like uh, of uh, of uh, of uh, one man one woman gives you a, that one child. They believe that if you uh, if you uh, uh, if you copulate with anyone like a one a multiple men copulate with the same woman, mm -hmm. they're all the fathers of that one child that mm -hmm. shows up, mm -hmm. and so they all act as fathers to the sure. uh, to a single child. So that sure. child has several fathers. They're all part fathers, and they all take turns in distributing uh, parental duty in that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, um, but uh, and those those things work great mm -hmm. uh, as in, in terms of individual yeah. freedom, sure. uh, individual sure. uh, happiness and sustainability. Yeah. They're happier than mm -hmm. the Western world. They're they're more sustainable. The only problems with uh, the, that li the li li lifestyle is what humans are intended to live. Mm -hmm. I agree with the idea that um, uh, uh, there's th that type of distributed, you know, free market, if you will, uh, attitude is absolutely wonderful for uh, happiness for um for uh, for the development of quality culture mm -hmm. uh the only problems come about when um somewhere somehow a culture arises that isn't um such a thing right uh, and so, so in the uh, example we just destroys it mm -hmm. the distributed systems like that are human systems like that are extremely weak to uh, invasion and destruction by larger monopolies Right, whether they be governments or whatever. But just just as these tribal societies might have a fairly voluntary free market, you know, uh, thing going on, you get into these larger like the Aztecs. Well, now you have human sacrifice going on, and this is hardly you know a voluntary you know act right. um, which respects rights and things. So just because these smaller tribal societies had free markets doesn't mean that today we have a free market. Oh no no no! I'm not saying that we today we do, but I'm saying that the free uh, a, uh, an existing human free market allows for the creation of governments. It doesn't stop it. Oh uh, okay. So, I, I kind of see what you're saying, and I'm and I'm not too opposed to what you what that is. What I'd say is that so long as the government is voluntary, and so long as the individuals may at any time withdraw from participation, then yeah, you can actually have within a free market you can have governments. You just can't have coercive governments. You can't have involuntarily well, participatory you governments. Have them, but you can, but they, they, you, they end up rising. Well, we, so the, we see the fact that some filled with a variety of yeah, the, the fact uh, I don't have a free market's great, but how do you stop that? The fact that there is a pirate that will attack you and kill you doesn't mean that he has a right to do what he does. The fact that he exists doesn't legitimize his ethical action. What's the right, but? I, I, I agree, but uh, what is the point of a right if it can't be protected? That's a good question. That's a good question. Um, I personally, there's, there's like, you know, in natural rights theory, there's a lot of ways to do this. Um, I'm going lately with the whole idea that a right is, the, the rights become real when they become an idea in the person and when that person defends them. So, you know what I mean? Like, uh, if I am attacked in the street, um, you know, I might have a, an, a right to not be aggressed against by a, another person, but and I might have a right to defend myself, but the right only becomes real in the world. It only becomes eminent when I defend myself. Right. Yeah, I can see that, I guess. 
So are you asking when it, the right becomes real in the world? Or are you are you asking uh, when no, it becomes philosophically I'm moral? Uh, no, no, I'm saying uh, uh, if so, you can have a like say maybe a right to your, your property or whatever, but that's great and all, and you can say that, say it's a moral absolute or something, but um, if it never actuates itself in the real world, either due to some other monopoly that's never shut down or stopped or, or whatever, then um, and you or you never have a system in place to protect those, then you know, do you even have them? Like if you have the right to habeas corpus right. morally, um, but no one ever gets habeas corpus anywhere ever. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it becomes oh. pointless until something can be done uh, about that problem. To ensure I, I, that I think get... that generally habeas cor corpus is still there, right? People still are made. In other words, you have to be present at your own trial, right? For the, the most yeah, part. Legally. Yeah, legally. Yeah, but I was right. just you know, giving it a hypothetical. Let's right, say right. A, a, some world where nobody is given due process of law, mm -hmm. but say that's immoral. Okay, mm -hmm. that's immoral, but how, what sort of system does it take uh, to, uh, to stop the violation of, of, of that uh, and to protect it in the future. Um, and my worry is that the free market is not capable of protecting uh, uh, right, natural rights or whatever human rights you want to have I would in the I would, long term. I would concede that right now the free market isn't particularly good at protecting people's security needs or defending people's, uh, you know, personal rights. But the reason for that is because government claims an exclusive privilege to a, f a monopoly of force within a geographical territory, right? So, in other words, when you have this, when when you know the slave master doesn't let you have tanks, right? Um, you know, the, the rulers don't let you have the power to defend yourself because that would be a threat to them. They give you only the that that which they allow that they feel comfortable with. Um, so right. that's not to say that you don't have rights, that a slave has no rights. It's just to say that the slave master abuses him. It's right. not to say that the Jews uh, I, don't I, have I, rights. It's just I that agree. the Nazis you, abuse them. And, uh, you have exist, we have existing monopolies like uh, on force like governments that prevent you from being able to exercise full individual freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, if you, say, removed all that and just made it disappear with a snap of a finger mm -hmm. and you had the free market there uh as you know people normally interacting mm -hmm. and trading and doing whatever with no one saying they can't do what they want yeah. my huge concern is that um over time human nature will naturally naturally tend toward uh, centralized systems uh, either through apathy mm -hmm. uh, uh through apathy and through active participation mm -hmm. through the flow of cultural forces mm -hmm. and whatnot uh, and then uh, inevitably those rights will be violated um mm -hmm. I, there's all sorts of uh, quotes, you know, um, uh, evil only prospers when good uh, men do nothing. Good people do nothing. Yeah. Um, uh, in my issue is that you have to have some sort of system, cultural or otherwise, mm -hmm. in place that act as a acts as a constant bastion of defense of individual sure. rights. Sure. And you know, again, and like of course you might say, well, the individuals are best defense uh, and yeah. defend their own best defender, yeah. which I would agree with if the system is existing, if the existing system is distributed. Mm -hmm. But the moment you have a someone that's an entity that's acting as a monopoly and force, mm -hmm. in order to overcome that monopoly and force, of force, people have to create a, a, either a, 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 even if it's just temporarily, they have to create a large coalition against, of force against it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, when we're getting into kind of um, a lot of uh, predictions of probability, maybes, and, you know what I mean, extrapolations of possibilities. So, um, and we're getting to the time limit that I have right now. So um, we probably should wrap this up. If you have any closing thoughts, and we maybe we can continue this uh, discussion on possibilities in the future. Um, it's just that I got, I got to get going in, in, in right now. Uh, I guess my clo a closing thought would be that... Um is it possible to implement a uh, cultural change in people's minds and mm -hmm. transmit that cultural change through um, in number of generations to maintain uh, individual freedom and stability through a free market system? Or do we, or uh, as humans, is it our nature to always have to have some sort of uh, monopoly and force that uh, exists to protect us in some fashion? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Are we our own 
uh, are we our, are the, are we the harbingers of our own doom? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wow, that's quite the mouthful and a very good question, uh, Mr. Johnson. It was a pleasure speaking with you once again, and uh, thanks for joining me. Thank you for your time. All right. <laughs>